Okay, so now we're interested in uh, the rate of energy loss by evaporation, because if a liquid evaporates from a surface, then we know um, that takes, it absorbs some energy from that surface, and the amount of energy it absorbs is the mass of the evaporated water times the latent heat of vaporization, which for water is 2,256,000 thousand joules to vaporize a kilogram. So <clears throat> to know the rate at which um, the surface or the, um, the object is cooling down, we need to know the rate at which water is evaporating from the surface. Now that rate turns out to depend on the concentration of water in the air, or what is proportional to that, the partial pressure of water in the air. So pressure is due to collisions on the molecular scale and air is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and some water vapor. <clears throat> so the total pressure is 101.325. The partial pressure is the amount of that pressure that's due to collisions specifically from water molecules. Now <clears throat> that partial pressure of water vapor will reach a maximum value and that maximum value is called the saturation partial pressure okay and saturation partial pressure just means that the at that point no more water can evaporate the concentration of water in the air cannot increase at all if the air is drier than that if it's unsaturated then more water can evaporate into that air but at this point, it's saturated, and there is a balance between evaporation and condensation. So if you have, say, um, close to the surface of a swimming pool, we're going to say that that air is saturated. That means that some molecules of, of water are leaving a liquid state and joining the vapor state in the air. But at the same time, molecules of water in the vapor state are colliding and condensing and um, rejoining the liquid in the pool. So at saturation there's a balance between those two. Now it turns out there's an equation that says how much partial pressure you get at a given temperature and we'll derive this later. So it tells pressure of the vapor when the air is saturated is some initial value p naught times an exponential function and in the exponent we've got the molar mass times the latent heat of vaporization divided by the gas constant times 1 over temperature minus 1 over this reference temperature. Now <clears throat> mu is a symbol for molar mass that's kilograms per mole and uh, T is the absolute air temperature. Now P naught and T naught, a good reference point here, is the triple point of water. At the triple point of water, the partial pressure of water vapor is 610 pascals. And you can see that starting at that point, uh, this is liquid and this is gas on the water phase diagram, that it does roughly look like an exponential function. And so the point is we can start at that point um, and then at a higher temperature, T, we can figure out for the air what the saturation or maximum partial pressure will be. And that is sort of like the maximum concentration of water vapor in the air. And then it's still a higher temperature. There's another maximum um, saturation vapor pressure. Now the air doesn't need to have that amount. Um, it may be slightly drier than that, as we'll see. Now this equation we'll derive later in the course, but for now we're just going to use it in our discussion of evaporation rate. This is important because if you've got a swimming pool or any, uh, any surface, this could be the surface of your skin with water on it, the rate at which water is going to leave that surface and evaporate is going to depend on the difference between the concentrations close to the skin and the concentrations farther away. Now we'll assume that right next to the skin, 
it's actually um, saturated. So there's going to be one temperature here for the surface, that's T. Then there's going to be another temperature up here for the environment, that's, you know, the air above the skin. Now, <clears throat> this right here is, is saturated. So that means it's assumed to be saturated. So that means we've got, we're at the saturated, we've got as much water vapor in the air as possible. Now up here, it isn't necessarily saturated. The actual pressure up here, so the actual concentration or the actual vapor pressure is a percentage of the maximum or saturated vapor pressure. Now, <clears throat> that percentage is known as the relative humidity. And you may have heard, you know, the humidity is 90%. That means <clears throat> of the maximum concentration of air, of water vapor that you could have in the air, you've got 90% of that value. So we'll use the symbol phi to stand for the relative humidity. That's down here. Okay. And then the, um, oops, that's messy. That's a phi. Very good. And so the actual vapor pressure of the air at that point will be um, a percentage of the saturation vapor pressure at that temperature. Now, because these two temperatures are different, there's different maximum water concentrations. You know, say like your skin is warm and the air might be cooler or your swimming pool might be hotter. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's really the difference in those two concentrations, the difference in those two vapor pressures that drives the evaporation of water from the surface. So we can say here that the actual vapor pressure is the saturated or maximum times the relative humidity. Anyhow, we would expect that the evaporative flow rate would, would just be related to the difference between those two because it's the difference between, say, the saturated at the temperature of the surface minus the actual at the temperature of the environment. You know, that's like the driving force. And then we divide by, quote, unquote, the resistance to get the flow rate. And the flow rate is going to be a mass flow rate, right? So it'll be the mass over time of water that's leaving the surface. Now, <clears throat> in, in terms of the resistance, in other areas of physics, mass flow rates would be found using diffusion constants. But it turns out that that doesn't work here very well. Um, and the, the flow rate although it ends up depending on the difference of these vapor pressures, this sort of quote-unquote resistance ends up being estimated um, or modeled through a bunch of experiments and then an experimental fit to the data. And so what we find is that the rate of evaporation in kilograms per second, so that's, you know, d m d t. All right, so this evaporation rate then, it does depend on the difference between the water concentrations. So we've got the saturated vapor at the surface, so that's T. Then we've got the partially saturated vapor. <coughs> um, in the environment, and it's the difference to those two concentrations that drives the evaporation of water. Now, the rate of evaporation is also going to depend on, obviously going to depend on the surface area. And then we do an experiment and, and we find out that it depends on the speed of the wind linearly. And then there's just some experimental constants that best fit the data. So that's point not eight 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 plus point not seven eight three times the speed, and this is all divided by L V, the latent heat of vaporization. So 
this tells us the rate <clears throat> at which <clears throat> the kilograms per second of water that will evaporate from a surface or any other liquid. And it's driven by that difference in vapor pressure. So a quick example now, a practical example, a runner. So we know the surface area, we know their skin temperature. So their skin temperature, that will be um, assumed at the skin that it, it, we have uh, saturated vapor. So uh, 273 plus that, we'll have to find what the vapor pressure is at 307 Kelvin using the Clausius Comparin equation. Then the air is at 30 degrees, um, and so 20% humidity. So the actual vapor pressure will be 20% of the saturation at uh, 303 Kelvin. So both of those pressures then we need to compute. Okay, so we apply the clausius Couperin equation and we know that this saturated pressure will be P naught, so that's 610 pascals, times an exponential function that's minus mu well, we'll use the molar mass for nitrogen, which is 18 grams per mole, or 0 0.018 kilograms per mole, multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization of the water, which is 2,256,000 joules to vaporize a kilogram. Then we'll divide by the ideal gas constant, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, you should work through those units and show that you get reciprocal temperature out of it, or sorry, temperature out of it. This should be in units of Kelvin, because then when we do 1 over our, uh, hold on, sorry, just checking how I wrote it, 1 over T, so the temperature is 307, minus the reference of 273. So this is reciprocal Kelvins, so this should be Kelvin. So we end up with a nice dimensionless exponent. Okay, so this works out to 4424 Pascals. So that is the vapor pressure, saturation vapor pressure at 307 Kelvin. And we'll assume that the, that the air right next to the skin is saturated, so that tells us the <clears throat> the pressure of the water vapor in the air, and that's a ref that reflects um, the concentration of water vapor in the air. So now in the environment we're only at three hundred three Kelvin, so it's going to be essentially the same calculation, but because we're only at twenty percent humidity, we're just going to multiply by 0.2 at the end. So this is six ten, and then it's going to be exp, and a number of those terms are going to be the same. Okay, so. It's the same molar mass, it's the same latent heat of vaporization, it's the same ideal gas constant, but we're only at 303 Kelvin, um, and the reference point's still 273. So we work that out, then we multiply by 0 0.20, and I get 717 pascals. So that's the actual vapor pressure at the 20% um, humidity for 30 degree air. So now we work out the mass flow rate by evaporation. So this is the amount of liquid water that's leaving the skin, and um, evaporating into the air. Because the speed term is zero, that just disappears from our analysis. What's that coefficient again? 0 0.0783. But we're told the air is at rest, so that just goes away. And we've got the latent heat of vaporization here. And then it's just the difference of those two pressures. So 44, 24, minus 717 in Pascal units. And so that works out to a flow rate of 2.19 times 10 to the power of minus 4 kilograms per second, which is 0.21 grams per second of evaporated sweat, or about 788 grams an hour which is probably about reasonable because you, you hear stories of how, you know, say like hockey players lose, you know, pounds of, of weight every game. And so if you were running, 
for a solid hour and being sweaty for a solid hour, you know, that's about 700 grams of water that you'd have to drink. So it's about a liter. That seems about right. So <clears throat> now that, of course, is the mass flow rate to find the rate of energy loss, right? The corresponding energy, well, that would be per hour. So you've got 0 0.788 um, kilograms per hour. And of course, for each kilogram of evaporated water, that water is going to absorb 2 million joules from the surface. So <clears throat> this is the energy that's absorbed from the skin, or let's use another word, it's the energy that's transferred from the skin to the environment. Right? This is one way that the body cools down. When sweat's vaporized, the water absorbs energy from the skin, evaporates into the air. So the energy is being transferred, so transfer from the skin to the air thereby cooling down. Now there's lots of interesting things that you can see from this equation that make a lot of sense. Uh, one thing is um, if your <coughs> air temperature or your, your air partial pressure, if the air becomes saturated next to your skin and <coughs> so that these two pressures get closer together, then um, sweat doesn't, sweating doesn't work anymore. Evaporation, evaporative cooling shuts down. And then the only way that you can cool down is through convective transport. But that also depends on a temperature difference. So as the air gets really hot, that one shuts down as well. Um, so this, of course, is the origin of heat stroke and the inability of the body to get the energy um, out of the body and into the environment. And if the energy builds up in the body, then the temperature increases. And then you get all sorts of bad things happening because it disrupts homeostasis. Anyhow, that's the thermodynamics of the human body, and um, <clears throat> obviously evaporative cooling is really important. So that's why we did this example. And that's our pre-lecture for today, and that's the third way that we can dissipate energy to the environment. We had Fourier's law of conduction. First of all, we defined thermal resistance, and then we said the rate of heat flow to the environment depends on the uh, driving force, which is the area and the temperature difference, and then it varies inversely with the thermal resistance. Next, we talked about heat flow by conduction, and we said that also depended on the same driving force, but then it depended on something called the surface transfer coefficient, and that ends up reflecting uh, the surface condition and the velocity. Lastly, we've introduced the phenomenological or experimentally based equation for uh, mass transfer rate Point seven eight three. Yes, these are experimental constants, so I never remember the values very well, and I always have to look them up. Uh, and then times area, and then times the difference. Oh, great! The difference between the saturated temperature, sorry, the saturated vapor pressure at the surface, and then the actual vapor pressure at the environment. And the actual vapor pressure is a certain percentage, the relative humidity of the saturated. So those are our three mechanisms for heat transfer. We have a third one, which is radiation. We'll pick that one up in class.